actually go up there? It's up there. I thought you said there was nothing to be afraid of. Sean, is that you? It's me, sir. How are you? I'm doing good. Jeff in Vegas. How are you? I'm great here in Los Angeles. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you, man. We're neighbors. How's things in LA? Uh, you know, I mean, people are uh, doing whatever it is they're going to do. So <laughs> what about out there? Uh, kind of the same, you know. I think we're going to be locked down here real soon, but who knows? You know, I don't Interesting. know. Yeah, they tried to kind of open stuff up here a little bit. Um, you know, they started, I mean, the bars were open for like a week and there wasn't much advance notice. So all my friends that work in that industry, they were like, oh yeah, all of a sudden it's like we're open, but they had to order all of their stuff. And by the time they got everything in, the city was like, or the county was like, no, 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 we're shutting it back down. So. Our governor closed the bars last week too. So I think we're just about I'm just so frustrated. I've been quarantined for three or four months. I've been a good boy. And now it's just like for nothing, you know, just. That's kind of how I feel about it. It's sad that there was like such a lack of an end game, I guess, to where it was like, oh yeah, we're all going to like stay in. We're going to curve this thing. And then all of a sudden it's kind of like in the States, we're like, hey, I guess it's over or let's try to just get on with our lives after all. And you're like, why, why? Well, I think the elected <laughs> officials had pressure from the business community and everything. So I, I I don't think there, there's no national plan to say everybody does the same thing. So hopefully yeah. that'll happen soon. But in the meantime, we're quarantining at home. We need yeah. something to watch. We need yeah. a good scare. Any recommendations? <laughs> ah, man, you know, uh, yeah, there's a lot of good uh, films out there right now. So, Well, specifically The Animal Among Us. And I love the beginning of the film where you have the drama class going on and they talk about masks. And I thought, right. I know it wasn't on purpose, but that's, that seems so relevant today about the mask and anti-mask debate going on around the country because of COVID. So. so funny because obviously like, okay, so we, you know, Jonathan Murphy wrote the film years ago. We shot it years ago. So who would have thought? And I honestly haven't watched it since this has occurred. So I never made the mask connection until you said that. Well, I understand there's trouble at the Mary Maker Cap Grounds. What's going on up there? Oh, man, you know, nobody can agree on anything in that place. And nobody knows what's real. It's massive paranoia. Everybody's driving their own agenda. It's actually a pretty accurate reflection of what we're dealing with in our country today. I mean, your movie's a giant metaphor for COVID-19, isn't it? <laughs> apparently it is. You know, it's interesting because like there are there is a tremendous amount of social commentary in the film. And in all actuality, you know, it's like you're the first person to kind of bring this up as far as some of the parallels of what we're seeing in our country like right now and what people are dealing with an animal among us. And I mean, really, that's what the film is about. You know, it's to make you kind of question like, well, who is the animal among us? And hopefully each character in there is pushed to a position to where they have to face some more like uh, lower thinking, primal motivations and urges and i think that that's a lot of what we're seeing right now is people's system of beliefs is they're being challenged on a regular basis nobody knows what's true everybody's having to reevaluate their lives and it brings out those tendencies <laughs> i love the character uh Baumgartner. he wrote a book about the murders that happened at the camp now he's actually living out a nightmare because the camp is opening up 10 15 years later but now without giving any spoilers away he's living the nightmare that he wrote about so i thought that was a cool twist yeah, I really loved that that Jonathan Murphy, the writer, came up with that. And it was one of the things that really captured me about the script was, you know, we talk a lot about like, does, does art imitate life or does life imitate art, right? And usually in films, you kind of like get that, oh, this is based on a true story, like theme that's touched on a little bit, but it's rare that you see it explored to like, this degree to where for Roland, it really is almost like he's manifested his own reality. And to your point, without giving away any spoilers, he has a great line where he kind of says, you know, like, oh, I'm trapped in my own book. And it's just, I feel like that's a really fulfilling moment because hopefully that is what the audience is thinking as well. And where did you find the camp or the location to shoot the movie? Because it, it seemed like it was an essential part of the story and it looked pretty creepy. 
Yeah, well, thanks. So, you know, it's kind of, I guess, a cliche. You always hear this when people talk about films, right? Where they're like, oh, the setting is another character all in of itself. But it's so true because obviously it's the stage that the story is presented on. And if, if the stage isn't set right, the story will fall flat. So we spent a tremendous amount of time looking for the campground. We looked in several different states. Um, but in the end, we ended up settling on a campground that was relatively close to where I grew up back in southwestern Ohio. And the interesting challenge in finding the campground really was you would find campgrounds that were very sparse and very minimalist and very primitive. And they didn't have things that we would need as far as like running a production out of them. So we slept our cast and our crew at the camp and we, that was our base camp and our set. So we needed air conditioning and running water and we needed to be able to cook and have electric and different things like that. So you would either find something that was so primitive that you didn't have a good place for your base camp and we were actually missing some set pieces or the camps were so new and they were so fancy that they lacked atmosphere. So when we finally found this camp, it was ideal because it was the best of both worlds. The camp's been around since the late 1800s. So it had completely dilapidated older parts of the campground that were barely used. And then they also host Fortune 500 companies. So it had like the top of the line uh, accommodations for, for us to stay and operate out of. So it was, it was perfect. And, and tell me about the challenges of shooting at night, because you have a lot of night shoots there, especially in a forest setting. There's no natural light coming in anywhere. Yeah. So it, it seemed like it was really difficult to get a lot of those shots. Yeah, so it was. And look, you know, it's like one of my big pet peeves in horror films, really regardless of any size, um, be it huge ones or small ones, is lighting at night. Like it's so hard to get it right. And I mean, on the big ones, I feel like they're often overlit. You're in the middle of the woods and are these unjustified light sources. It's like there's like three moons and they magically light everything up like it's blue, which I've never been outside in the woods in the middle of the night and seen it look like that. So that kind of bugs me. And then on, you know, smaller horror films, there's always a lack of light. Like it's really hard to see. So I did the best I could to walk the line between the two. I would have liked to had a little bit more light, to be honest, but chose the red epic because of the low light capabilities and chose a relatively fast lens just to be able to get more light into the lens. And my DP did a great job with that. And then also like our gaffer did a great job in trying to find justified light sources. But you'll notice that most everything that takes place in night is near a justifiable light source. There's either headlights from a car, headlights from the four wheeler, headlights from the Mary, or I'm not headlights, lights from the Mary Maker sign, or they're right outside of a building. So as they're walking by it, we're getting ambience from windows and porch lights and different things like that. And that was very calculated to try to find a, a degree of natural justification for lights at night. And tell me about the casting of Larissa. That's a great coup for your film, and she was really great. Yeah, that's, that was amazing. And look, like Larissa just took the film to a whole nother level. I mean, she absolutely killed it. And it's funny because Jonathan Murphy, he had worked with her years ago. Um, on another film that they had done together. Uh, and they hit it off really well and had become pretty good friends. So when we started to get a little bit closer to like actually shooting and the film was financed and we had a lot of like cast members locked in, I think at that time um, we had Christian Oliver as Roland and we had uh, Aaron Daniels as Roland's wife and we had Heather Tom as Marilyn Bishop and a few others. Um, and so we were really looking hard for Anita. And it's funny because the idea I had in my head was maybe much more like kind of your standard fair, like horror leading lady. And Murphy was like, no, no, we got to talk to Larissa. We got to talk to Larissa. And so we sent her the script and she loved it because it is a bit campy and cheeky and it doesn't take itself too seriously. And she's obviously very sarcastic and has a great wit about her and a great sense of humor. So she liked the script. She sat down with us. Um, we talked through it and she's like, yeah, look, she's like, I'm game. I'm willing to do it. And it's funny because I had never pictured her type in that role, but within sitting down with her within the first like minute and a half, it was like, no, this actress can take this to a completely different level because of just her personality and humor and wit and sarcasm and energy and everything she brings. You know, if I was a casting director and John Fry walked by me, I would just cast him just because of his mustache. I mean, that guy had such a presence in the movie. 
right his mustache as a character in and of itself and i go way back with fry i actually met him in the early 2000s on another film that i was working on and he was still fighting back then and i mean we hit it off great you know and it's like um just have always maintained a great friendship and once you know i read animal among us i was like oh my god like don fry is burl you know and we had worked on that film early in the 2000s then I did a short film and he was gracious enough to come out and be in the short film and we had a great time. And I mean, just one of the, the greatest human beings you could ever meet. He's just a spectacular guy. And to your point, he's a, he's a character. Um, so he fit it perfectly. And I was able to get a hold of him and say, hey, man, you know, love to have you if you're down to do it. And he's like, yeah, cowboy. And uh, couldn't find a better fit, right? Perfect fit. Um, now, the animal among us, was there many discussions of what the animal was going to look like? Yeah, there was obviously a lot of conversation about what the animal was going to look like. And it's interesting because like it kind of took on its own, um, it kind of took on its own thing. You know, it's like, without spoiling too much, we knew that we had to try to be able to show the animal without showing the animal. And we knew that the animal needed to be a mystery for the characters in the film, as well as for the audience. So really it was a finite line in trying to like walk the line of believability between like, okay, what is this? Could this thing exist? And how would it affect you if it did? Like how much would you see it or be aware of it? So a lot of the film is built around this like looming idea or presence of it and i'm not gonna lie man it was really hard from a directorial perspective to show the animal without showing the animal especially in the daylight scenes because you're just like yeah how are we gonna how are we gonna do this you know and it really kind of like uh directly affected my entire kind of like shooting philosophy for the film and doing a lot of like shoulder rig, a lot of steady cam, and a lot of handheld so that we could keep it kind of loose and feral feeling and try to embody the creature and the animal and the energy in the camera work, but also allow us to show it without showing it when we needed to like whip pan away. <laughs> and you know, they say never judge a book by its cover, but everybody judges a book by its cover. Everybody judges a movie by the movie poster. Animal Among Us has a great movie poster, great marketing. How did that come about, all the different incarnations of the poster? So that's, I got to give like my distributor, um, Keith Leppard at Uncorked Entertainment, mad props for that, because that's on him. We had done a lot of concept art. We worked with a guy named Oscar Ankerud, who's um, from Switzerland, and we've become really good friends with him, and he had done a lot of concept art for us. So he did this poster that was really amazing with these jaws kind of in the forest, like wrapping around a log cabin and trees, like, you know, ripping up around it and then four silhouettes of characters with flashlights. And it was really cool. And we felt like it really captured the film. So when Keith decided to take the film on, you know, we talked about using that art and Keith felt like there was a degree of ambiguity in the poster that just wouldn't sell. So he wanted to make it a little bit poppier. He wanted to be able to appeal a little bit more to that broad stream commercial um, audience. And I think he did a great job with it. And he, you know, he was gracious enough to give us meaningful consultations. So, you know, he put something together and he'd send it over to us and we kind of talked through it and what we thought, you know, and what he thought. And he would take some of our ideas and then he'd inject some of his ideas. And at the end of the day, that's what we came up with. Um, the, the picture of the animal on that, I literally shot maybe three to four months before the film was released with one of my best buddies back in Ohio on my parents' farm. Um, huge spoiler alert, but that costume, as you see it on the package, we, I rigged it up basically like on a lawn chair on a patio table and stuffed the shoulders and dressed it and everything like that. And we shot that and sent it over to them so that they had something to work with from the actual image or creature in the film. to get like a scarecrow kind of looking at you. Yeah. And that's the thing where, you know, it's like the idea is hopefully when you look at it, it's like, is it, is it a person in a costume or is it a creature? And you really shouldn't know, you know, it's like, again, not trying to spoil anything, but hopefully throughout the whole film, a big part of the fun is kind of trying to crack that code, you know? Well, John, congratulations, man. I had a good time with it. And like I said, I love the, the poster art and I love the feel. 
and uh, congratulations on it. And uh, it's available now on video on demand. And where can you get? Yeah, so um, I think it's still available on Dish and Direct and Xbox and Google Play, YouTube, um, Vudu, and a few other. And then it just hit Amazon Prime and it just hit uh, Tubi. So you can go there and watch it as well. Whoever find horror movies are sold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, we, they did a good job on the placement for us. Well, awesome job, man, and uh, congratulations. And we'll talk again soon. Come visit us in Las Vegas, and I'll come to LA. I most definitely will. And uh, be safe. And then thank you so much. All right, man. Take care. Take care. <laughs>